I don't think this has a, has a pointer. Anyway, you can see some of the nice houses that they built for some of their employees. Here's some other houses that Anglo Platinum have also built. This is actually from a case study that uh, Daniel mentioned. This is uh, New Gapila, they call it. This is in the Limpopo province outside Mohalakwena mine of Anglo Platinum. And just to illustrate again that Anglo Platinum, in many ways, is indeed a leader in these things. Just the other day they got another award for their reports and for climate change issues and yesterday we heard from the, uh, the, the, the pension fund PRC that they've also been rated highly. So, so let's look at how they deal with some of these issues and Mohalakwena is an example of how not to go about resettlement. Just quite bluntly and they recognize this for, to their credit and they're trying to learn the lessons and uh, as an indication of why, this is old Kapila, the village that was meant to be resettled. This is uh, Rose Diabella. She, she's insisting on not moving. Why? Because it's, it's a very complicated story and I can't go into any of the detail. But I'll just give you one example. They, the company basically approached this like a project management approach. And to say, okay, here's a community, we need them to move. We put in a gun chart and we put in some project management guidelines and processes and they fail to recognize that moving a community is not building a bridge. It's a very complicated and complex exercise. And so, so to his credit, the engineer who was involved or the project manager who was involved actually at one stage asked his leadership, can I please have a, an anthropologist or some kind of social scientists to come and help me on this project and he was declined on his request. I think that was one indication of where things started unraveling now with very significant financial costs and reputation costs to the company. So I don't want to pick on a pick Anglo Platinum because as I say I think they're doing a lot of things very well and in this, rep this latest report deals with this issue quite, quite uh, in, a, in a thorough and, 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 and sincere manner. But this illustrates, and those of you that want to look at this case study, they can read our, our report if you're interested in some other things that have been written on it subsequently. Now, just, just, just in case you think I'm picking only on mining, and uh, Iqbal mentioned uh, microfinance. A couple of months ago, I was in, uh, uh, I had an interesting meeting with the senior management team, CEO and, or the MD, and a couple of his uh, senior managers of such a micro lending company, uh, microfinance. And I was actually struck by this because this meeting was about their corporate social responsibility strategy and basically for an hour and a half they talked about two things. One is the bursaries that they're supporting for college in Cape Town, which is, is a nice thing to do. But, uh, but I was concerned that this was the emphasis. And the second thing was recycling of paper in their business and, uh, well, and, and waste. There were a couple, maybe one or two other things, but those were in many ways the emphases. So, so I felt, and I said to them towards the end, you know, I think you guys are really missing the point. You are at a crucial linkage with a large proportion of society that is financially indebted and going more so, getting, becoming more indebted, more stuck in a quagmire and, 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 and slippery slope of poverty, partially due to the products that you sell them. What can you do to work with those customers and then perhaps next phase you could also think about your thousands of employees rather than the 20 bursary recipients that you're actually focusing on in this meeting. A, there was an entire shift that I thought was very important in understanding that it's not about a bit of philanthropy on the side, which is fine, but it's, it's not the core. And actually what really matters is the interface between the biz core business and where they can make a difference um, in, in, in shifting damage to a beneficial relationship. So one framework that is quite useful, and those of you that would like to read on this, is quite a nice, recent, well, it's not that recent anymore, it's four years ago, uh, by Michael Porter and his colleague. So he's very well known as being a, uh, a management writer on strategy, and he's emphasized how some of the ways that you could frame the interface between business and society in a more strategic relationship, moving from the, the left side there, which is you know, focusing on generic social impacts or mitigating, mitigating harm in value chains, to actually transforming value chain activities um, 
with a view to finding those mutual beneficial relationships and mutual um, benefits both to society and to, to the business. And then also understanding the competitive context and making social contributions to that context is, is in a more strategic version of, of the CSI that we've come to know in a way. So, yeah, the, the, the right the right hand side being more the, 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 the ambition here. This this, this, this is a graph that actually you saw, this is a more recent version of a graph that um, the CEO of Woolworths showed you yesterday. We've been working with Woolworths to develop this, this management um, measurement tool for the company. And I think it illustrates how effective measurement on strategic objectives can really drive this in a company. So uh, I, I won't go into this because of time constraints and because um, uh, uh, the, the speaker spoke about it yesterday. Now let's just take a step back from some of these sort of case studies, as it were, to, to some other work that we've been doing that looks at uh, the broader sample of South African companies. Um, Fruti mentioned this work that we did for the NBI, and one of the things that came out... Oh, I think this slide went missing. Anyway, Fuji mentioned it. We, we highlighted those particular areas where companies, we felt, were really missing um, some key concerns around land, around security, around um, supply chains. And, uh, but, I mean, it, it was a study that, that I think is also available to those of you that are interested. We then subsequently, subsequent to this work for the NBI, we went back to that research and we actually said, let's look at the top 100 companies and let's have a more rigorous approach to the methodology uh, to, to publish this in a, an academic journal, and then you need to set up hypotheses and so on. And I think some of them are quite interesting because they, they relate to some of the common assumptions we have about what kind of companies do well and what, which companies don't do so well. So just very briefly, and some of them also relate to international debates of John Ruggie and so on. So the first hypothesis here, if you're an extractives company, chances are you're going to have a greater exposure to these issues, uh, NGOs and government, and so you're going to show greater diligence on human rights. Number two, actually, let me get a sense from you. Do you think number one was supported? <laughs> 